In the headlines, another point of inter-Korean tensions. South Korea calls for a wage freeze and an inter-Korean business park, despite North Korea's unilateral demand for a pay raise. Exports, a traditional backbone of the Korean economy, are losing steam. The contribution of outbound shipments to Korea's growth fell to a five-year low last year. And no breakthrough yet in talks on Iran's nuclear program. Two days have passed since a self-imposed Tuesday deadline. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Adirang News. Thanks for tuning in and coming to you live from Seoul. I am Kang Tae-ri. Tensions are rising over North Korea's unilateral demand for a pay raise at the joint Gezong Industrial Complex. The South Korean government is calling for a raise of freeze until an inter-Korean agreement is reached, warning of illegal measures against companies that disregard this order. Our Hwang sung reports. In a statement on Thursday in Seoul, the Unification Ministry asked for a minimum wage freeze for North Korean workers until a deal is reached between the two Koreas. The ministry warned that companies ignoring the freeze could face administrative and legal measures under the Inter-Korean Exchange and Cooperation Act. The statement comes just over a week before payday for the workers starts on April 10. Last month, North Korea demanded a unilateral pay raise and revision of 13 regulations, including scrapping the current salary cap of 5 percent. South Korea says these issues must be settled through government-level talks. The wage tussle is raising concerns that another unilateral shutdown of the complex could follow. But experts say Pyongyang will refrain from repeating the closure it initiated two years ago. If the Kaesong Industrial Complex closes again, it will be hard to turn inter-Korean relations around. So it's highly likely that North Korea will use it as a means to intimidate and pressure South Korea. The Kaesong Industrial Complex, where more than 54,000 North Koreans work at 124 South Korean companies, is the last remaining form of inter-Korean cooperation. A high-ranking South Korean official said that the best way to improve the management of the joint business park is to open it up to more foreign companies. Now, both sides agreed to that measure nearly two years ago, but little progress has been made so far. Hwang sang Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye met with the U.S. Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi in Seoul on this Thursday and discussed a variety of pending issues, welcoming the U.S. bipartisan congressional delegation to Korea. President Park stressed that their country's alliance stands stronger than ever. She added that support from the U.S. Congress was the key in maintaining bilateral ties. During talks, Pelosi sympathized with President Park over the issue of Japan's war time sexual enslavement of Korean women, saying it's a women's rights issue that should be resolved. Pelosi was Speaker of the House when it passed a non-binding resolution in 2007, urging Japan to accept its historical responsibilities during the Second World War. The U.S. delegation also urged for increased cooperation towards making the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement more beneficial. In her third year in office, President Park Geun-hye has a number of issues to resolve on the diplomatic front, including deadlocked inter-Korean ties. Our Choi Yoo-sun tells us which issues are most important to the Korean public. In a recent survey of 1,000 adults conducted by local daily, the Tonga Ilbo and the Asan Institute for Policy Studies, 27 percent of respondents said improving inter-Korean relations should be the administration's number one foreign policy priority. More than 80 percent said President Bak should hold summit talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Even three-quarters of those who consider themselves to be politically conservative, often hardliners when it comes to North Korea, said an inter-Korean summit was necessary. Analysts say this reflects South Korean fatigue after two years of deadlock and no tangible outcome from the country's North Korea policies. Additionally, 40 percent of those surveyed said Seoul should lift commercial sanctions on Pyongyang. The sanctions were imposed after the North's torpedo attack on a South Korean warship in 2010. 
While it remains a sensitive issue, support for the lifting of sanctions jumped 10 percentage points in five months. Still, people thought it was necessary to maintain strong deterrence against North Korea's provocations, with 60 percent saying Seoul should employ the U.S. anti-ballistic missile system, THAAD, to counter security threats from Pyongyang. Moving down the priority list, South Koreans felt that Seoul's alliance with Washington and its economic partnership with Beijing deserved attention. As for Seoul's frosty relations with Tokyo, two-thirds of Korean people said the two sides should work to improve ties even if Japan continues to deny its past atrocities. Respondents said better relations with Japan are necessary to settle historical issues and to reduce economic fallout. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. Speculation is mounting over the possible de deployment of the U.S. missile defense system to South Korea. And this as the South Korean and American defense chiefs are set to meet in Seoul next week. Our Kana Kim tells us more. Will they or won't they? With around a week remaining until U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter arrives in Seoul for talks with his South Korean counterpart Han Minggu, the elephant in the room is whether they touch upon the possible deployment to the Korean Peninsula of the U.S. missile defense system called THAAD. The U.S. government has not formally proposed talks on THAAD. If Carter suggests official discussions, it becomes a political issue. So in Washington will then be pressed to make a decision. Some observers believe a bigger issue needs to be addressed before the U.S. proposes talks about that. Experts say that Seoul and Washington would have to agree on the severity of the North Korean nuclear threat in order for that talks to proceed. Budget sequestration in the U.S. meant defense spending was cut. The U.S. believes North Korea has scaled up its nuclear threat, so the Pentagon says it needs more funds. The South Korean government, on the hand, is not keen on increasing its defense budget. Other experts think that is unlikely to come up during Carter's visit. China's reaction on the THAAD issue, very controversial. I don't think that he's going to raise any controversial issues at all. Rather, he will say the U.S. commitment to the defense of South Korea. China and Russia say THAAD threatens their national security because the system's radar has a range of up to 2,000 kilometers, meaning it would cover significant parts of their mainland territories. Sandwiched between Beijing and Washington, Observers say Seoul must make its own objective decision and not be swayed by the superpowers. However, until official talks on THAAD materialize, the two countries will focus on trying to find common ground on security, military and diplomatic issues at upcoming defense talks in Washington and Singapore. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the U.S. defense contractor that developed THAAD has reportedly been providing information about the system to the South Korean government. A representative of Lockheed Martin told the New York Times that it's been supplying information to Seoul and Washington as there's a possibility that Seoul might purchase the system. But South Korea's defense ministry denied the report today, saying it has not received any specific data. The ministry said says that back in 2013, one of its agencies did request information on THAAD for research purposes, but ended up not receiving any materials. Korea's exports are losing steam as the country's traditional growth engine. The contribution of outbound shipments to Korea's growth fell to a five-year low last year due to sluggish demand abroad and falling global oil prices. Our Hwang Jie has the details. Just one and a half percentage points from Korea's 3.3 percent growth last year came from exports of goods and services. That equals a contribution to growth rate of around 45 percent, the lowest reading since 2009, right after the global financial crisis. 
The Bank of Korea data shows that the contribution rate shot up to over 200 percent in 2011, but has been on a downward trend since then. Now, concern is building over the recovery pace of Asia's export powerhouse Korea, as demand at home also remains fragile. China's slowing growth is a major uncertainty for Korean exports, which rely heavily on the world's second largest economy. It's unlikely that the domestic economy will improve drastically this year compared to 2014. Korea's exports actually dropped for the third straight month in March, with a decline from February to March, logging the biggest slump in over two years. The government blames the fall on the drop of international oil costs, which are keeping prices low for petrochemical products, one of the major exporting items. But even if oil-related products are not counted, outbound shipments rose a mere 0.2 percent in March from the previous year, pointing to sluggish demand from consumers worldwide. The government says it will devise short-term measures like strengthening the competitiveness of local small and mid-sized exporters. But experts add that it's more critical to diversify and expand Korea's exporting market to the Middle East and South and Central America. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. More and more foreign customers are becoming interested in fashion and cosmetics products on Korean online shopping malls. And to get this trend going, the Korean government is pushing to simplify the purchasing steps for international buyers. Our Song ji reports. Boosting foreign online sales of popular Korean items could give domestic manufacturers a big lift as they struggle in the face of slowing domestic demand. For example, Korean online shopping mall OKDGG.com reported that they carried one million items last year, tripling the numbers from 2013. Sales also escalated twofold to eight million U.S. dollars. The most popular goods were Korean fashion items like accessories and clothing, followed by cosmetics. Currently, foreign direct online purchases amount to less than half of Korea's online direct purchase total of one billion dollars. But the government sees big potential in this export channel and wants to encourage overseas customers. Active Many Korean websites require ActiveX to make online transactions. The security program only works on Microsoft's Internet Explorer web browser, meaning that customers using other platforms cannot shop on Korean sites. By 2017, the government's aimed to make 90% of the top 100 private websites ActiveX free. In its place, they're promoting HTML5, which operates on all platforms. Analysts also point out the need to set up websites in various languages, as most of them only are currently operating in English, Chinese, and Japanese. Song ji Arirang News. Korean police have unveiled their plans to make the roads safer and more stress-free for drivers as well as pedestrians. They're in the process of developing the system where they can use traffic information posted on social media like Twitter and Facebook. Arushin Samin tells us more. Millions more eyes will be on Korea's busy roads from later this year under a new police program. The National Police Agency says its 2015 Traffic Safety Guide will be implemented in the second half of the year, and it'll have more of the focus on public participation. Under the new scheme, drivers will be able to report car accidents or heavily congested roads to the police via Twitter or Facebook. Once shared, the new program will automatically send notifications to drivers or dispatch officers to the scene if necessary. It'll also relay useful info to drivers using its so-called urban traffic information system. Citizens will also be able to record and report traffic violations to the police instantly through a free mobile application. Mondays and Fridays will be designated Traffic Order Enforcement Days. 
On these days in particular, the police will keep an extra close eye on and crack down on drivers violating traffic signals, tailgating, and other traffic related offenses through cameras located at crossroads. The number of automated cameras near so called school zones will be expanded to 300 by 2017. Through the new measures, the National Police Agency says it hopes to cut down on road traffic accidents and free up traffic flow in Korea's major cities. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Koreans spend an average of 3.7 hours a week on cooking, and that's apparently the least amount of time among the 22 countries recently surveyed. Market and consumer researcher GFK, which surveyed over 27,000 people, says the global average is six and a half hours. Topping the list are Indians and Ukrainians. They spend over 13 hours chopping and stirring, followed by South Africa. Americans, Indonesians, and Italians. Sweden, Belgium, and surprisingly, France joined Korea on the lower end of the rankings. The researchers say Korea's low weekly average may be explained by the wide range of affordable eating options like street food, delivery, and prepared meals. Spring is one of the best times of the year to pack a bag and go traveling. To help, the Korean government has picked out some of the must-see destinations in the country. Our cultural correspondent Kim Jian gives us a sneak peek. When the days start getting warmer after a long cold winter, that's when the travel bug bites. So how about taking in some of the best attractions in Korea? The tourism ministry has rolled out its annual list of the top 100 places to visit. Standouts among them are five traditional palaces built during the Chosen Dynasty, all located in the capital city of Seoul. Sites where travelers can experience traditional culture were also included, such as the Pukchon Hano village, Insadong, and Namdaemu market. But the top Top travel destinations are not just limited to the capital city. Built during the Shilla dynasty, the temple in Gyeongju city is not only a beloved relic, but also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Soraksa Mountain in northeastern Gangwon-do province also made the list, with its accessible hiking trails and panoramic views. And in the southernmost Jeju Island, there's a 90-meter-high crater at the top of the Songsan Ilchulbong Peak. The crater was formed by a volcanic eruption 100,000 years ago and now serves as an ideal spot for horse riding. More information on these top travel spots can be found through the state-run Korea Tourism Organization. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. No breakthrough yet in the talks on Iran's nuclear program. Two days have passed since Tuesday's deadline in Switzerland, with the six world powers and Iran still clinging to the hope of a possible deal. To tell us more about this story and more, Paul E. is joining us from the News Center. So, Paul, what's the latest on the talks? Well, after eight straight days of marathon negotiations in the Swiss city of Lusane, Iran's top diplomats said there had been significant progress. However, no final result has emerged. The seven foreign ministers say differences remain on key details, including Tehran's future atomic research and the lifting of U.N. sanctions. Despite some progress, experts say the P5 plus one countries and Iran remain deadlocked on major issues. I think, uh, by all accounts that I've heard, the uh, outstanding issues are UN Security Council resolutions and uh, research and development of Iran's nuclear program. More specifically, the Iranians want all six UN Security Council resolutions to be terminated. Uh, the P5 plus one has uh, other ideas about whether or not that's a good idea. <laughs> and then uh, on research and development, Iran would like to increase the amount of research and development that it carries out on different technical aspects of its nuclear program over the duration of any deal that is signed. The two sides also want different documents at the end of this round of talks. Iran wants a general political statement, while the UN Security Council member countries plus Germany want to include detailed steps leading to a final accord, 
set to be reached in June. Mm. And on to another type of negotiation. Debt talks continue between Greece and its European lenders. And it appears one high ranking EU official is expressing optimism that a deal can be hammered out soon. That's right. European Council President Donald Tusk said he was confident of a compromise with Athens and its creditors could be reached by the end of this month. Speaking from Madrid, Tusk described the current situation in Greece as under control. When asked whether the European Union was prepared for the possibility of a no deal outcome, he said the focus was only on striking a beneficial agreement for all sides. I think that today we can say that the situation in Greece is under control. And uh, I, I don't think that it's my role today here in Madrid to speculate something about, you know, Plan B because uh, uh, we are focused on. On, on this discussion about Plan A, it means um, successful finance, financial assistance to, to Greece under, under European rules and under, under conditions uh, we mentioned in this uh, agreement from the 20th of February in Eurogroup. Meanwhile, the Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras sent an updated list of economic reforms to Eurozone partners on Wednesday. Greece is urgently seeking to unlock much needed financial aid as the government is only weeks away from running out of cash. Mm. And shifting to the United States, Paul, California has declared a state of emergency as it faces one of its worst water shortages and desperate times call for desperate measures. So how is the Golden State responding to this crisis? Well, the governor of California, Jerry Brown, has ordered the first mandatory water restrictions in the state's history. Now, this urgent action comes less than a week after he approved a billion U.S. dollar fund to provide relief to communities that are struggling amid this prolonged drought. Among the other measures include directing cities to reduce water usage by 25 percent, effective immediately. Brown made the announcement in Phillips on Wednesday, calling on all residents to do their part. We're in a historic drought, and that demands unprecedented action. For that reason, that I'm issuing an executive order mandating substantial water reduction across our state. As Californians, we have to pull together and save water in every way we can. California is entering its fourth straight year of record-breaking drought. Despite some rainstorms earlier in February, the state's reservoirs are at historically low levels for this time of the year, as farmers and businesses grow increasingly concerned of running dry. Mm. And uh, sh switching gears now, the New York International Auto Show has kicked off, uh, showing off the latest models for this year and beyond. What's the biggest trends is set to hit this industry? Well, based on the showroom floor for 2015, it looks like a big focus for luxury and better technology with more of an emphasis on the latter. For instance, Kia Motors is phasing out CD players and hardwired onboard navigation systems in favor of wireless apps and smartphone integration. Experts say it's part of a broader push by car makers to infuse vehicles with cutting edge technology. Manufacturers are looking at what technologies are necessary from infotainment to safety, consumer expectations of USB connectors or Bluetooth or backup camera, and now it's things like lane departure or blind spot detection or front collision avoidance. And as a nod to stricter emission standards, many of the new models have been refreshed with lighter frames and improved fuel efficiency. The New York Auto Show is set to run through April 12th. Trey? All right, Paul, thank you so much for those uh, stories. I can't believe they're phasing out uh, CD players already. All right, uh, let's leave it there for now, and we will see you again in just about two hours.
and welcome. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather forecast. Heavy rain is falling here in Seoul, amounting to about 10 millimeters per hour. And this is some good news after the recent dry conditions we experienced here in the central regions. And more than 100 millimeters of heavy rainfall will drop over the areas of Jeju, while up to 40 is in store for the inland regions. Now, the system will gradually clear up by tomorrow afternoon, but keep in mind that it may be accompanied by strong winds and stormy conditions. And after the rain, it looks like bright and clear skies are in store through Saturday, but more showers are in store on Sunday for areas down south. On to tomorrow's readings. The daytime high here in the capital hits 16, Daegu remains warmer at 23, Gwangju hits 18. Moving on to other regions, Daejeon and Daeju peak at 18, Dokdo hits 14, Mount Kumgang reaches 7. Those are the updates I have for you now. I'll be back with more in just about two hours. Thank you very much, Po Gyeong, and that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.